And if I could leave people with one piece of advice I've learned from UPMC, and this, mm-hmm. we say this all the time there, and we're like, I'm like, I can't believe we say this all the time. But we, 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 when before we do something, we we always ask, is the juice worth the squeeze? And <laughs> I never thought about it that much before, but after 13 years of being exposed to it at UPMC, I just, I actually teach my son that. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the HMDL podcast. We have a really great special guest today, um, a friend of mine that I have just been very inspired with how she has grown her career in marketing. Uh, marketing for the largest um, company uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, I think it is, right? And so just Lillian Young, we have on today, and she's the Vice President of Marketing Intelligence and Brand at UPMC. And so Lillian, um, just a little bit about her background. She's an experienced Vice President of Marketing uh, with a demonstrated history of working in the hospital and healthcare industry, financial services industry, and in CPG. She's skilled in advertising, brand, consumer insights, and marketing strategy. She's a strong leader with a Bachelor of Science focused in industrial management from Carnegie Mellon University. You're probably a little too smart for me, but (laughs) welcome, Lillian. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to do this. Yeah, this is great. So I... We're trying to have great guests on here. We really want our listeners to learn about how to break into marketing, right? How to get a job like you have now. I mean, you, I, I, UPMC, right, is the largest employer in the state of Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Fundamental, yes. Okay. So you have, well, and I think there's somebody just above you, but you have the second top job, I think, in university, uh, uh, UPMC in marketing. And so... I really want to help our listeners understand how do you get there, right? Because I get asked all the time from people through LinkedIn and just how did I start a company? How did I get into advertising? And so that's why we're doing this. And so first I'd like to start off with um, explain to our audience what you do now and how you got here. I mean, that's a very loaded question, but you know, maybe just a little bit of how you got where you are now and maybe how many years you've been there. Well, I've been at UPMC for, I believe it's 13 years of lost count, but uh, I think it's 13 years. It's uh, the longest I've ever stayed at a job. So um, this is this is a really long time. I love it there. Um, not many places in Pittsburgh where you can have the opportunity to do all of the different I guess, the career options that are at UPMC. You know, I was able to move around um, and expand and develop and reach a higher ceiling and never having to leave UPMC. In fact, um, you know, all the jobs I've had at really big brands, um, we're all here at Pittsburgh. I've never had to move, which has been really great. Um, As you know, I have a son and so it's great not to have to uproot him, Um, but, Yeah, I started at UPMC after Del Monte, and uh, they wanted me to move to San Francisco, and I'm just, I'm an East Coast girl, I didn't want to move to the West Coast, and I was looking for another job, and it really is about who you know, the network that you have, the contacts that you have, almost every job I've gotten is because, um, you know, it was obviously posted and I applied, but I also had advocates within um, each of the, each of the organizations who, you know, had spoken up for me and said that I was a great worker, a great person, sparkling person. Yeah. That kind of yeah. Thing. Um, and, that, and, and, uh, and that's great. Yeah. So did you know your boss before you came to UPMC? Is that what kind of helped a little bit or did somebody just introduce you to him? Yes. Uh, not this boss. It was a previous boss, but okay. yes, we were from PMC actually. Okay. Um, okay. So she called me um, mm-hmm. and asked if I wanted to come and apply for the job. She was looking for somebody. She didn't have a job description. She just knew she needed someone. And uh, I had been recommended to her by a couple of people. So she had me in. Um, and I started the job without a job description because I was I was up for the challenge of whatever it was that they were they needed. I love hearing that because, you know, we've hired um, some people on our team for the same thing you know just get in here don't worry what it is right now get in here show you make the job your own and show maybe show us what you can do and and that has been successful for some of our employees and so um so what was your title when you got there when i first got to upmc it was director of Mm -hmm. uh, i think just marketing communications because um they weren't exactly sure what to do i 
spent some time uh, when I was at Del Monte. So I left from Del Monte. So it was a promotion to come to UPMC. I was a senior manager at Del Monte. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And so you got in there, director, and then, um, you know, obviously vice president. Sounds great. And um, I know you do a lot of things and you've been a big part of, I know their growth. Um, you know, what a great company that is always innovative and continues to build. And, and I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I'm jealous of even some of the marketing people that work there that I could never try to poach to get over here. I would love to, but they just love their job and they love the company. And I think that says a lot for a company that size. So you, so do you feel the culture? What do you think the culture is? Because that's important for a company to keep people like that. Yeah, I think that um, it's not for everybody, but I mean, anywhere you work is not for everybody. I've worked at some places where I immediately started to think, well, I'll be here for a year, but I'm not going to make this a long-term thing. Um, you know, my team is uh, handpicked. Um, you know, I, I've picked people I've worked with before or who've been recommended to me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I make sure I have a hand uh, in interviewing them to make sure they fit culturally. You know, when you get to the point where you're interviewing with people, it's almost table stakes that you have the skills to do yeah. the job. It's the soft skills. Can you fit into the culture of the team, the culture of UPMC? Do you get along with everybody in the team? Do you fill a gap in what we need? Not everybody can be big thinkers. There have to be some mm -hmm. oriented people. There has to be diversity of the way people work and the, and the kind of soft skills they bring. Um, and so, you know, we make sure we keep that kind of balance in the team. I know that a lot of companies go through those personality tests and, uh, you know, it, it almost seems like an unnecessary step, but it, there really is something to be said about balance. Yeah, we brought on um, DISC. We're getting ready to put a post up about the DISC, um, yeah. you know, test because we started using that to communicate better with each other and more so to communicate with me. Um, you know, I'm the owner of the company. My name's on the door. If, if you probably don't like how I run the business, you probably will never like how I run the business. And so we're starting, just like you said, we're handpicking our people and we're making sure they fit the culture before they even start here. Because that really is what I've learned over the years is that there's, you know, this, this market size alone is 2 million people. I can't find 30 people that think the same way I do or think, you know, the way the culture that I want it to be. And so I think that's great that you said that, that it's really important to have hire people that really think the same way or have the culture or could fit the culture. Because I think a company the size of UPMC, it's really hard to keep a culture, you know, uh, that size. So that says a lot about the company. Um, so what do you think, um, you know, obviously you've had a lot of promotions in your 13 years there. Um, and what do you think has contributed, if you could say one thing that maybe has really helped you grow and helped you move up that you felt like you, you did all the time and you got it right and, and that really helped with your growth? Because I think that's what people want to learn. Like long-term, how do you stay in a company? How do you grow? Well, I think, yeah, part of it is personality, um, but it's something that you can learn to do. But I've always been a big believer. And if you see something that needs to be fixed, you fix it, whether it's your job or not. You know, um, a lot of times there's a vacuum in the fact that uh, people have always known that this was wrong um, or didn't work right or there was a gap um, and they just let it be. That's the way it's been. That is the way it all is. And I've, I have this, I don't know if it's a obsession, <laughs> um, some OCD, I don't know, but I, I, if I see something that is not working quite right, right, especially when it comes to consumers, customers, patients, members, and I want to make their experience better. Um, you know, I'm like a salmon swimming upstream sometimes. I mean, I, there are things that I've been tackling for years um, that will never be uh, fixed, but I'm hoping that I make things incrementally better that, you know, somebody notices when they pick up the phone and call for an appointment or um, whatever it is they're doing that their experience is a little bit better because of some of the internal pieces that I've tried to tackle. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of people are very happy when you point it out and you say, you know what, we're going to fix this. And, um, and they're like, yes, let's do that. Um, but somebody has to step up and say that. Yeah. And I think, um, 
you know, one of the things that we, you know, when we try to hire people, I think what we're offering is maybe faster change because, you know, in a company your size, it, you know, you might want to try to fix something, but you, there's so many layers, right? And so just the fact that you can even try to fix it or that you're attempting to fix it, I think it's huge. And so, because that is one of the things we kind of sell against, like, you know, maybe going to a bigger company is like, if you want to grow faster, if you want to learn faster, if you want to move faster, you you have more opportunity to change and, and make a difference at a company this size, you know? Um, what would you say is maybe a more challenging part of your job? I think that piece of it, right? The, yeah. The negativity that sometimes surrounds what we do, I, I think, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school when I say that, we don't explain ourselves um, yeah. adequately enough. Uh, we make decisions, but we don't tell people why we make decisions and therefore it's misunderstood. And uh -huh. um, I think the go-to explanation is, you know, profits over people um, when actually, you know, patient satisfaction experience care is at the center of a lot that we do. Does it bring us in money? Yeah. But I mean, we're a business. We have to bring in money in order to do the things that we need to do in order to make people better. But, um, you know, the healthcare um, industry is changing. Um, margins are thin. You can't make all your money off of uh, people in the hospital. People are taking better care of themselves. We have to diversify. We have to find better ways to, to do health care. Um, and, uh, you know, and some of those are business decisions. And, um, and I think UPMC a lot of the times is misunderstood. So trying to trying to overcome a lot of that, and you've seen our marketing. So we, we do try to show our best side in our marketing, um, you know, that, it works. Um, it takes a long time, um, but it does work. I think your marketing does a great job of showing your innovation, where at the end of the day, I think people want, I mean, it's your life, right? It's your health. <laughs> so yeah. if you're going to leave with anything, saving my life is going to be an important <laughs> aspect of your marketing <laughs> that I'm going to tune into. So um, but you're, you're resonating something, you know, with me that I find happens with us too. Um, you know, we, we on the back end are spending so much time taking care of our clients and doing all the big work that we need to do to move the company forward. And a lot of times people don't know what all that is. And so, you know, just like your point is, is like sometimes you're just like, you're moving forward because you're innovating and you're doing all the things right, but you don't have the time to sit and scream out loud about, hey, this is how we did it, or this is why we did it. And, and I think that that's, that happens a lot, right? And I think it's hard to try to kind of have a happy medium there. Because at the end of the day, you're moving forward to save lives. I mean, that's really what your marketing says. That's what you guys are as a company. You're winning multiple, you know, awards around the country, around the, you know, the internationally on what you guys bring to the table. And so I, I think at the end of the day, I think, you know, it is hard, but you're, you're doing everything right, you know? So, yeah. So what, um, you know, I think with the most exciting thing, because I was very excited about it. I don't even know why was that you have a new CEO, it's a female. Yes. Yes. And um, I think that says a lot because, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, you always want to look, you want your C-suite to look like the market, right? You know, you want it to look like um, the diversity that maybe every company should have. And I think, you know, I saw a lot of like men at the top. And I think that what's exciting is just to see a woman now be in charge. What, how do you, how do you think that's going to change anything? Or do you think, I think it will help the perception, right? So that's one thing. It seems like she's getting a lot of praise from everybody too. Everybody's excited about it. Leslie, Leslie Davis is the new mm -hmm. CEO and uh, she is a great person. I've had um, opportunities to work with her when she was the president of McGee and when she was the chief operating officer and, and president of the hospital services division. So um, I've gotten to know her and she is a, she's a wonderful person. She's very warm. She's very caring. Um, she's still driven, um, obviously, to make it to CEO um, and mm -hmm. to that level she has to be. And uh, and there, are, there have been a couple of changes. I don't know if they were as touted as Leslie, but UPMC has um, hospital services division, the insurance services division, international and enterprises, which is- She led all that, right? Is what I read. She was leading, she led a lot of that stuff. This was she her- lead a lot of that stuff. But right now, Leslie is the CEO. The president of insurance services division, Diane Holder, is female. Yes. 
the president of Enterprises, uh, who just took over in January, Jean Cunicelli. She's also female. Um, and so they are looking for a replacement for Leslie's old job at the top of hospital services division. And uh, that only leaves international, uh, which Chuck Bogosta is the head of, but a um, lot of female representation okay. in our C-suite. Good. You know, and I, I always say it's the best person for the job. It really, you know, it really shouldn't matter gender, but it's always good to see that, um, you know, that they found the best person for the job and there's, you know, different genders at the top. So um, I think that's important. So um, I think, you know, knowing you personally, I'm very excited that your son just graduated college and I know you are very excited about it. So what's that like? What's that been like to have a son now finally graduating? Has he had any issues finding a job? Like, you know, tell me about what it's like to be a parent of a new soon, uh, a very recent grad college. Yeah, so he graduated in May from Michigan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've always been proud of him. He's, he's a self-starter and yeah. uh, he's, he's a thoughtful kind person. So I knew he would do well. Um, but the pandemic, uh, actually helped him. It mm -hmm. was a senior year. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, as you know, he played football and, uh, he used the pandemic. Um, he opted out of football. So he had his senior year, he didn't play. So it freed him up a lot. And because Michigan was uh, remote, he was able to do a lot of the stuff he wasn't able to do while in college. So, you know, hang out with his friends <laughs> and, and travel, even though it was a pandemic, but, you know, young people, um, you know, he and his, uh, his uh, girlfriend were very safe and, and traveling, but, uh, you know, he got to go to a lot of places that he'd always dreamed he could go to. And with work starting around the corner, you know, he was never going to have that kind of opportunity of, open time again. Um, so he had an internship in, for last summer during okay. the pandemic. Um, and then when everything shut down, his internship was canceled. But uh, what was great was the company that he is working for offered him a full-time job instead. So he didn't oh. have to search. look for a job or search or go through that. That's huge oh, yeah. for what's happening right now. Yeah. yeah what did awesome. he major in? What did he major in? Uh, Sales and marketing. Okay. Um, yeah, I think he wanted to be a scientist, but the football team said, uh, they said we need your grades to go up, not down. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants great. to be a scientist anyway. That's not a good idea. <laughs> now, is he gonna is he gonna follow his mom's footsteps if that word marketing is attached to him? Oh, um, uh, he's more of a sales guy, but he's not even doing that. He his job is more consulting. So okay. he's for um, he works in the information industry, um, sort of like a Gartner or Forrester, where they have clients and they're looking for information. So he works in middle market private equity, um, doing due diligence for acquisitions and um, and mergers and and business decisions that those guys make. For, so um, not exactly where I thought he'd end up, but he seems to like it. And so he's it's his first it. job too. Yeah, yeah, it's his first job, right? So, yeah. um, but no, that's great. I mean, just being, I think that's important too, because some of our listeners could be right out of college. I know the advertising field has been really hard for them um, because, you know, it, unlike marketing, you can move around in the business world and do different things. But when you're specialized in advertising and more of that creative or kind of um, maybe working at agency, they were hit a lot, obviously, with COVID. So um, do you work hard on a good life, work-life balance? Or do you feel like you have one? What's it been like since COVID? Because um, you used to probably go in every day, right? And now you can work. I didn't go in every day. Um, actually, uh, our CMO, my boss, Dean, um, mm -hmm. He wanted people to work from home um, part-time before the pandemic, um, but I, weirdly, he couldn't convince a lot of people to do it, but they needed to come into the office to do their jobs. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, because it was so foreign to them, the concept, and uh, then the pandemic hit. Now, you know, everybody's like, I'd like to work from home 100% of the time. And he was like, well... We need people to come in uh, because he's a strong believer, as am I, that the younger um, and newer folks that are in the office need to interact with others um, right. at least a couple of times a week in order to pick up on stuff. Like I said, UPMC is complex, and um, you know if you're if you're not having those hallway conversations, if you're not, you know chit-chatting with other people in your group on a regular basis, which you can do 
virtually, but it's much more conducive in person. Um, you know, you miss a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, I feel like the people who are who are straight out of school and they're missing some of the soft skills, the politics. How do you navigate your way through difficult situations? Uh, learning how to read people and uh, you know knowing your audience so that when you talk with them or try to ask for something, you kind of tailor it to the way you think that they would like to hear it. Um, I don't think you can learn that in isolation. I do believe that you need to observe others doing that. Yeah, and we used to never hire entry-level people. Um, we just started doing that right before the pandemic for the same reason, because um, nobody understood this work from home thing, especially when you were right out of college. Uh, you know, that's the time you meet a lot of people. And so we finally started, we do have some more entry-level people and it is working out, but that is always a fear for me that, that that they won't feel like they have enough physical time with people, you know? So I'm starting to add some more fun things to make us be able to get together more and maybe have them join groups and stuff. But yeah, that's a fear for us, but it works out. They've been great as far as the verbal and the, yeah. I don't know if you've, I, I went through this um, body language seminar once with a guy or with a woman that worked for the FBI and really it's um, it's only 20% of what we say is what we're communicating. So it's that 80%, the, the nonverbal, the tone. And what's interesting is before COVID, we never put our cameras on. So we were always virtual and we used to get, like people wouldn't hire us because they'd be like, wait, we're gonna hire some company that works from home. But we were kind of laughing all the way and being like, we're so, we get so much great work done. You know, we're so, we're just really, we, it, I just couldn't find a reason to, see everybody every every day but we never had our cameras on so once we put the cameras on now we feel like we see each other every time so at least that helps a little bit you know but i agree with you in a company that size um it's important you know mm -hmm. we're we have a huge footprint and uh we have folks in erie and central pa and you know overseas that i might actually only physically see once a year or once every couple of years um all the rest is email or maybe a phone call this way I feel like I see them all the time they feel more part of the team especially the, the folks who are part of marketing but in far flung places they never really felt as connected as I hear they do now yeah yeah and we you know we started hiring for talent outside of the city of Pittsburgh because it was so hard to get it and so I opened three offices for that reason uh, one in Rochester New York one in Harrisburg and one in Cleveland and we never saw them. And then all of a sudden we're on camera with them all the time. And yeah, we feel like we, we see them all the time. So it's, it's, there's a lot of good, you know, obviously that obviously the disease itself has not been good and, and what's happening in the world and people dying from it, but there has been some good change, I think for business. So, um, you know, you staying in a job for 13 years, I think is not the norm today. And so, and, 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 and you know, the millennial generation and now with the Z generation coming up, they tend to switch jobs faster. Um, but I'm starting to see with this Z crowd that they're willing to stay somewhere longer if they feel the culture, they understand the culture, and they feel like they're a part of something. So I, I know you talked about you know why you love staying there, but any advice out to somebody on why they should stay at a company for more than two to three years? Yeah, I, I think that... Um the camaraderie and the relationships that you build enrich your job. Um, when I was at PNC, one of the questions on the employee satisfaction survey seemed silly, but it had a purpose, which was, do I have a best friend at work? Um, they found that uh, there was, people were happier, more productive when they had great relationships at work. I feel if you're moving around too much. And I understand that you do have to move around in order to grow. Some places there's not opportunity for growth where you are, or you're unhappy, or, um, you know, and I'll say advertising, um, that's the way you make more money, um, is that you have to hop around until you get to a level where you don't have to hop around. Um, but uh, I, I think it is important to build those relationships to, to make friends at work. Um, it does lead to a far richer experience, um, a better experience. And people are more productive together when they're comfortable um, um, and, and want to ask the hard questions or don't feel silly coming up with ideas where other people, if they don't know the people they're working with, may not 
offer up some of the ideas or the questions that actually might make a real difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all great stuff. And, you know, and then, um, you know, obviously I know you through networking. I met you at a party. We always talk about that. We didn't even know who each other were. And everybody's surprised we didn't know each other because we kind of work in a similar industry. Um, but how do you network? What do you do to network? Um, any, any thoughts on how to network in a, in a post-COVID world? Uh, how to network before COVID? What, what do you do to network? Um, you know, I think a lot of it is uh, relationships um, with people outside of work. So the uh, vendors that you have, um, you know, they move around as well. Um, so, you know, we call the our vendors are more like partners at UPMC. You know, we're friendly, as you know. We like we like um, to be called a partner over a vendor. You know, yeah, yeah, so we're, that's a good yeah. term. We're actually really uh, quite friendly with a lot of people we work with um, because uh, it's very strategic, the work that we do, um, and you spend a lot of time with them, and if you don't like them, then that makes everything hard. So, um, you know, it's, and I found in my career, I don't know if you found this, but there were people who, no matter where they go and work, you always seem to still bump into them and work with them in some other capacity. Um, mm -hmm. There was a woman I knew at Ketchum who was a media planner. And then when I got to PNC, she was actually a rep at one of the stations. And so she was my rep. And then I went somewhere else and she was a rep at a different station. And then I did something else and she was she was doing something else. And it was sort of like, no matter where I went, you know, I always had uh, this relationship with this woman. Um, and it's... Pittsburgh is small and a lot of people Very. don't leave or if they leave, they come back. So you really, um, I had an old boss who used to say, yeah, to keep your, <laughs> keep your heels shiny. Um, you know, don't burn <laughs> any bridges because, you know, you never know where, where that person's going to pop up again. Oh yeah. Like that's a hard lesson to learn here in this market because I used to always joke, um, don't burn a bridge in Pittsburgh, even though there are 300 of them. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of chances that you're going to make it over to the downtown Pittsburgh on a bridge, but you should not burn any of them because, wow, it really comes back to find you in this market. Okay. I mean, do you think that's like that in other markets or maybe smaller markets? I think so. I mean, well, it doesn't really matter because uh, advertising you know, as a general rule is not a large industry mm -hmm. um, and the agencies that I've worked with in other cities there are people I know from Pittsburgh or from other relationships, uh, you know, because at Del Monte, I think we had like 15 agencies working because every brand had their own agency. Um, and what I find is that, you know, people stay in that same kind of job. They might move to a different city. They might move to a different agency, but you really do encounter them. Um, and so I think the, like the ad bed is a great place. Um, Network. Yep. Yeah. The professional organizations are a great place. It, again, friends at work where you meet, other friends through them. Um, and then um, sponsorships, business opportunities, and um, the partnerships you have with people outside of your work um, are great. There are people I know that, you know, now, you know, the are heads of, of big corporations who I knew when they were just, you know, regular working folk. Um, and there are people, all the heads of these agencies here in town, you know, when I worked at Ketchum, they were all account execs, they were copywriters, they were art directors, they were just, you know, regular people. Now they're, you know, captains of industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> I've been working, you know, now for, I don't know, 20 some, 27 years. I can't, I don't remember. But, you know, the point is, yeah, the more you grow and the less bridges you burn and the more you stay connected, you know, eventually heads will turn over on different corporations and maybe a friend comes in and, you, and they like your style and they like how you work. And, and that's why I think the main uh, information here is don't burn a bridge. <laughs> I say that all the time when I'm interviewing people, um, you know, sometimes my team will be like, eh, you know, don't follow up with them. Who cares? And I'm just like, look, this person could be the next, they could be running Google as for <laughs> office. I don't know. But the point is you just never know where anybody's going to go. And so yeah. I try to be even vendors because I used to sell media before I started my agency. And sometimes people, on my team are like, I don't understand why you're responding to them. Just tell them they're a gnat, tell them to, you know, 
And that was somebody that didn't fit our culture that said that. And I really got offended by that because I was like, they have a job to do. Yeah. And I think you need to be respectful and take their information. You never know if you need them and you never know where they're going to go. So I think that's an important uh, lesson. So um, mentors, have you had mentors over the years? Do you mentor anyone? Um, I feel like that's very helpful for business. So tell me a little bit about any mentors that you've had. Or... Um, I think that I really do look towards um, people who have experience that I want within the organization that I'm in or even outside the organization. I wouldn't say I've had any um, formal mentors. Um, but uh, for instance, Marva Harris, if you're familiar with the Harris family, um, she worked at PNC um, as, as uh, part of the community banking. And she was is a great lady. Um, and what I learned from her, she always looks so put together. And I thought, oh my gosh, I always feel like I never look put together and she always looks so put together. Her nails are always done. Her hair was always done. I was like, I have to figure out what the secret is. I feel like <laughs> I would knock on her door at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. She was put together. Yeah. Um, she carried a coaster with her. And uh, and she was like, you don't ever want to leave rings on people's tables. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is, that is so great. That is so thoughtful. And I was like, I've carried coasters with me ever since. <laughs> so people just- I, I've never people. heard that. Yeah, that's, you know, and I, I think that's something that's, you know, I, I think it's sad that it might be going away is that respect, you know, dressing up for work, having respect for others, and maybe having respect that others don't, others don't want to see you in a t-shirt, right? Like, you know, <laughs> like, I think, I, I hope, I hope that doesn't go away, but I know that a lot of the younger folk don't like that, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think mentors are important, and even without even formally making them a mentor, it's important to learn from others, and, you know, shadow people, or maybe watch how they do it, or how they got ahead, and, and, um, you know, yeah, I have a, I have a, I actually do have a formal mentee at, okay. at UPMC, um, and she's wonderful, I like her, I like her as a friend, I mean, she's a new friend, mm -hmm. and, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of uh, things in common, and um, you know, she's and she's looking to me to to help her to advance in her career as well. And you know, and you know, I feel blessed that I'm able to help her because I have contacts inside to um, introduce her to um, yep. to you know help her to advance her knowledge as well as her career. Was um, that formalized, or you guys just said, "I'm going to mentor"? She did. She went to you and said, "Hi, will you please mentor me?" Or was it a formal setup? It is a. It is actually a formal uh, okay. program they have at UPMC. Yeah, that's great. We we have a sort of formal program. We call it the friend tour, uh -huh. and oh. so we try we try we try to pair up you know, people on our team, some of the new ones with the ones that are here and, you know, or maybe if we see somebody that's going to be up and coming in the department, we might put them with the head of the department, you know, just to kind of say, hey, you know, help, help them get where you are, because we don't have a lot of time each day to talk about how to help somebody grow as much as we do in the work itself, you know, so. And I think it's important because, uh, you know, even though, even if you don't have a formal mentor, mentee relationship, as I said, I've been influenced by people. I don't even know if they know they've influenced me, but you same. Yeah. You you touch people every day when you interact with them and you can leave a what not to do impression yeah. on them or a what to do impression on them. And so you have to be aware of um, how you come across and and the way you say and do things because words are important, actions are important and people learn from you and especially uh, more impressionable people who are just learning, you wanna teach them to do it the right way, not just by saying it, by, by, by your actions. Yeah, and I, I think another lesson, I don't know if you wanna share anything maybe that you would have done differently or did you fail at something that you felt like, wow, that really taught me something that maybe somebody could learn from? Hmm. <laughs> I'll give you a minute to think of that and I'll just give you one of mine because I have a million. <laughs> I, you know, I never look at things as failures. Maybe things didn't work out the way I wanted them to. Yeah. But, uh, Failure sounds know. very negative, but like, yeah. I, you know, for me, I, I feel like, um, you know, not handling things over the years, like sometimes if a client fired me or, you know, just not handling it is professional as I wish I did, you know, and that's something I'm learning 
later in life. Um, I mean, I was not, you know, a jerk about it, but you know, I just, I could have been better. Right. And so something like that, I think that I'm trying to help my younger team maybe learn some lessons that I didn't learn in the twenties. So something like that, maybe think of something that Disappointment is is hard to manage, especially when you don't um, when you don't experience it a lot. You know, mm -hmm. I think the younger generation is a little bit different than maybe our generation or generation above us, or even the generation directly below us. And the fact that um, they may not necessarily have been raised the same way we were. I mean, I'm Gen X. I was like thrown to the wolves. <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah, they were like, whatever, do it and be quiet about it and yeah, yeah. deal with that, deal with that disappointment, correct? Yeah, yeah. so, you know, I, I, I feel like, and this is not a knock on them or, or anything like that, it's just different. Um, there's, um, you know, when you talk about the way people interact with each other, whether they are, um, you know, different backgrounds, but there's also different generations and it, it goes both ways. Um, I think you know they need to really understand the differences between their generation and an older generation, how they work, um, yeah. and uh, be more self-aware. I think yeah. would be helpful for them. Yes, yes. What to expect, and the same thing. I believe in our generation, we shouldn't expect that they act like we do because they were raised differently. They come from a, a whole different set of factors and an environment, and um, and you and and they're much quicker and smarter with the technology and and yeah. and doing things faster whereas we might do it the long way uh, yeah, yeah. But, and i i think millennials really showed you know millennials get a bad rap but what they really did was they they broke up probably a broken system you know yeah. Um, you know, they didn't handle, like I said, I didn't handle myself correctly all the time. I don't think they maybe handled themselves correctly on some of the wars they put out there into the business world. But at the end of the day, I think they brought a lot of things that needed to change in business. And I'm very excited about the Gen Z generation because they were raised by Gen Xers. Yes. And so I think they get it right. I, I think that they are a happy medium between what millennials did wrong and what, um, you know, baby boomers taught their millennials wrong. You know, I think they've, I think they're getting it right. You know, they were raised completely with a cell phone in their hands. <laughs> um, I, I'm very excited about that generation. Uh, the ones I have on my team are so talented and they're just so respectful and they're so wanting to learn and sponge everything up. And I'm just very excited about that generation. And they know so much so fast. Mm -hmm. they're just yeah it's very exciting um well we're we're wrapping up so any final quotes or anything you want to share or something that would be a nice little send off to people that could learn from or uh i i will say you know i was i was looking over the questions you sent me and there was one thing that really did strike me and i i thought about it for a while and if i could leave people with one piece of advice i've learned from UPMC and this is, mm -hmm. say this all the time there and we're like I'm like I can't believe we say this all the time but we 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 when before we do something we're we always ask is the juice worth the squeeze and <laughs> I never thought about it that much before but after 13 years of being exposed to it at UPMC I just I actually teach my son that because he was trying to do something that was like pushing a rock uphill with his nose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like you gotta, sometimes you need to know when to quit and. Yeah, I mean, there are things that we all want to do, but is it worth the time, the effort, the energy, the frustration? Um, is the reward, the mm -hmm. payoff worth what you're gonna put into it? Um, yep. and I think it's a good way of managing what you're doing because if it's not, then it's it, it may not be worth doing. And, and yeah. That's it's a great important lesson for me. Even yeah. at an old age, you can't teach old dogs new tricks. You can't. I work on myself every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lillian, so much for the time today. Um, and thank you to our listeners for tuning into the HMDL podcast. If you like what you heard or if you want to hear more from Lillian, please reach out to her on LinkedIn. It's Lillian Marshall Young at UPMC. Uh, feel free to reach out to her, maybe ask her some more questions. If you like what you've heard, be sure to follow us on all our social channels. 
Um, I'm Shay Murtaugh, President of Health and Murtaugh, and we'll see you on our next episode. Mm-hmm.